Great. Thank you so much, Shira. Thank you for that introduction. And I am so excited to see all of you today. I'm excited for this conversation um, and to learn from you guys and to just talk a bit about what I learned um, from curating the show, Creativity um, and COVID art making during the pandemic. So since we're limited on time, I'm going to, and I wanna leave space at the end for discussion. Um, uh, I'm just gonna give a quick, quick introduction of, of who I am. Um, I'm a, a writer and an artist and a, a psychiatric survivor. I was um, diagnosed bipolar when I was 21. Um, a lot of my career before Mad in America, currently I'm the um, arts editor and social media manager at um, Mad in America, but a lot of my career before Mad in America was in arts nonprofits. Um, so coming out of college, I, I sort of really wanted to serve artists in my career because, you know, I myself am an, art, am an artist and um, and I really do care about um, the artists in, in our community. And, um, but it never, it never quite clicked as um, being in alignment who I wanted to serve until I started working for Mad in America and realized really, you know, um, how often artists are misunderstood and, and stigmatized um, by the psychiatric industry in, in a lot of cases. Um, so, um, Mad in America's mission, I'm sure you, you, many of you are aware of Mad in America, but you know, it's really to serve as a catalyst to, to rethink um, psychiatric care in the United States and, uh, and abroad. Um, but what you might not know is, is a very key understanding that Mad in America and um, Robert and, and everyone, um, the staff there, is, is that they really do value um, personal stories and expressions and art and the power of art and the power of, of um, creativity um, to be a healing um, power uh, or force in one's life and in society. So highlighting um, these expressions of, of, um, of surviving uh, sort of like a, a, as, as a person um, with, uh, who experienced mental distress, and the current paradigm of, of psychiatry, you know, um, Mad in America understands the importance of um, promoting and, and highlighting um, artistic expression. So we have a gallery um, that has an open call for art, poetry, and humor. Um, I run that. So, um, you know, uh, for submissions, you can uh, write art at Mad in America. And, um, you know, we put that up. So, um, when I came to Mad America, it seemed like the stars aligned, right? Where I could serve artists and I could serve psychiatric survivors um, and I could um, you know, really bring their stories to the forefront in, in that way. And this is what I tried to do with this exhibition, um, particularly with the struggles during the pandemic and how art helped us cope um, with the emotional impact of the pandemic. Um, so, um, I'll just say two things before, actually three things before we jump in, is I have a second screen. So sometimes it looks like I'm looking over here, um, but that's just looking at my notes. And the other thing is I'll take a few questions during the presentation, but because we have such a short time, I won't take many. And I want I want to leave a lot of space at the end for, for a discussion. Um, so um, feel free to pipe up during, but I, I won't take every question. I'll, I'll take one or two during. Um, the presentation. Um, so that said, again, um, we are talking about this um, creativity in COVID, art making during the pandemic. Um, we're taking artwork and statements, uh, uh, parts of statements from this exhibition to kind of expand our understanding of, of how art can help us cope and ask a few questions um, as we go along. So um, I'm, I'm going to put, I think I have just put the link to the exhibition in the chat um, if anybody wants to jump to it. And Shira uh, is going to um, put links to the artist websites where we have it, their names and the name of the piece as it's coming up so that you can check out the artists, their work more if you're interested. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, all right, and 
make sure that everyone is seeing what I'm seeing. Can someone just pipe in and let me know? Yep. All right, great. Yep. Okay, so one of the first things I wanted to talk about was sort of art and the body um, and uh, gestural relationships with materials and um, how that comes through in a piece of work and how that, um, a piece of art and how that sort of um, can help in, in, in the flow and movement of, of feelings and expression during art making. So sometimes like I, I feel understanding your body in relation to certain materials. Um, and when I say materials, I mean paint or pen or, or um, sculpture, you know, clay, all these different things. Uh, these are the materials that we're working with as artists. Um, um, and when we understand our body and alignment to it, um, as well as how emotions kind of move through our body, um, we open up sort of a, a way to um, a align the mind and the body with, with those material strengths, right? How they help bring about more profound um, expression. So this piece, um, Better Than the Child That They Suffered um, by Adam Forgite. I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong. I apologize so much to Adam, but Adam Forgites. Um, you can see here, if you look at the kind of brushstrokes that are happening, is that there's a body involvement in, in this painting. Is that, um, and there's a, a, a free flowing a, of sort of a, an energetic um, uh, uh, force or, or movement. Um, and you can, you can see that really, let me just come back to this and I can zoom in. These strokes are loose. They're, um, they're just, they're kind of wild in a way. He's still representing something, but he's really, you know, um, not letting uh, realism or, or any idea of what should be on the page sort of restrict him um, in his expression. So, um, I just, I just wanted to bring this piece in as this kind of example. And um, understanding how and what the materials are best expressing, um, their size, the nature of their mark, the kind of gestures that suit them best. For example, you could like, you know, think about fine point pens might better express a kind of uh, detail focus uh, 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 or, or a, a repetitive thing or something that, um, that is, is, is very, you know, um, fine, right? And then large brushes like we see in Adam's piece might be more, um, you know, unencumbered and, 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 and fluid in the body. Um, you know, a fine point pen might relate more to how you're, uh, you're, you're thinking, uh, your brain and your mind rather than, than sort of like a more, um, almost like a movement dance kind of um, relationship with the material. But I always, um, as like a practice um, to offer for explorations of this with when you're working with others, um, is one I did a couple of years ago, which was um, if you take, um, if you have space, if there's enough space, say you open up a, a floor, um, you know, wherever you have, you have a big piece of paper, like I'm talking huge, huge piece of paper, medium sized piece of paper, small piece of paper all sorts of different kinds of sizes of paper, even if you want to do a circle, circular paper, or rectangular, whatever, octagonal, you know, get creative, but then have all sorts of different kinds of materials, big brushes, huge brushes, tiny pens, medium sized brushes, medium pens, um, all these different kinds of uh, materials that make a mark, right? And then, and then um, experiment with how each of those, as well as your body, interact with the restraints of the paper or the, or the freedom that the paper is giving you and, and allow the person or yourself or whoever is doing this practice to, to, to feel that out, feel how each of those different scenarios feel in their body, how maybe one might come out as like, hey, this is like, how I work, you know, this is how I express myself. And then it just like kind of blossom from there. Um, so that's, that's one um, 
example of a, of a practice that I've done myself that, that I really love and, and would, um, would recommend um, trying with, with anyone. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is um, art as a container. So a friend of mine actually mentioned a, a, a theory, a container theory um, that really resonated me, with me in the context of art, where um, something is sort of holding a feeling, um, a thought, uh, uh, you know, um, some kind of energy for you. And I do see art as that thing and for myself. And I think it can serve that way for others as well. Um, and I'll go through and sort of talk about different things that art can hold. Um, one of the first things is, is altered states or imaginative realities, um, you know, however you really wanna um, see that. Um, and I wanted to say, you know, when I think about this, uh, I think about my own, um, my very first um, experience with altered states. And I grew up with an artist, uh, my mother. Um, and she sort of trained me to see life, you know, really as a work of art, like my own life. Um, so in a way, when I was in this state, I almost expected her to see what I was doing or what I was saying um, as, as me engaging in art making. And, and sort of I thought that these, these metaphorical ways of speaking would, um, and doing like one I thought of was um, when we were at the dinner table, um, I was moving sort of salt shakers around and salt and pepper shakers. And I thought by the arrangement of the salt and pepper shakers, I was communicating something with my mother because I had this understanding and this upbringing of understanding art making as, as life and not having a boundary around it had to be on a page, you know? Um, so an, an artist, um, Phyllis Levine, um, I'll talk about her later. That's not this artist, I'm sure has it. Um, this is a, a, or is it Phyllis Levine? No. Um, yes, it is Phyllis Levine, sorry. Um, I thought there was a, another quote here. Okay, moving on. You're right, Shira, don't worry, you did it right. Um, so Phyllis Levine exemplifies kind of how art making can be a container for uh, altered states. Um, she doesn't indicate in her statement that she's experiencing an altered state, but we can look at this as sort of like a, like a, a sort of unencumbered wild ima imaginative world that she's created um, here on this, in this painting. Um, in her bi biography, she says, and I had some of the statements in this show were so great. Um, she says, art is something that is always, I've always done to keep me sane. Partly I believe by creating a container, um, oh, sorry. Um, she goes on to say, it has taught me that I have to make the best of this reality we are living in, as that is what many of the characters I paint are doing. My art has taken on a life of its own as it seems to be painting itself and teaching me. My work is my salvation. Without it, I would shrivel up and malai like the witch in the Wizard of Oz. I will continue to express my emotional responses through my work until my reality settles down. Um, so so par in a way, you know, these, these wild imaginative images and things like that, that we know uh, can, when they're expressed, um, can sometimes, you know, in a way put us in danger um, if the people receiving it are not um, open to, um, to what we're expressing. Um, but when it is on a page like this, um, there's sort of a container for it. There's a container for it because art is malleable, art is forgiving, art is non-judgmental. When, when you're really engaging with it in, in a art heals kind of um, way. Um, and, and also I can zoom in here just so you can see the really wonderful detail of this, these pieces. Um, there's some jewels in here, um, you know, little, little bedazzled stuff. Um, there's some great, just wonderful flow of ideas and expression. 
um, you can see how this artist is just allowing herself to express what she needs to. Um, and we, we can talk a little bit too about art as a container for anger, um, where, you know, a personal story again for me is when I was a teenager, I had journal, journals and I was always journaling. Um, and in one journal, I actually took a pencil and I stabbed it and stabbed it and stabbed it and stabbed it over and over again. And, I, and then I took a picture of the kind of ripped up pages. Um, and to me, um, to see that the expression of this emotion was, was meeting a medium of expression, the page, rather than invalidating or, in di or dismissing it as, as like this, um, this uh, meaningless kind of um, acting out. It ter like terming it art and saying, this is a work of art. It, it validates and honors it in a way that can contain it um, and creates a metaphor, like I was talking about before, um, for understanding an emotional state rather than dismissing it. Um, so art has an a even a greater way of, of transforming even something like um, an outburst of anger like that, um, transforming it into something that has a place to be and has meaning and is real and valid and can be honored. Um, and that was, um, let's see, for the anger one, I didn't have a piece, I don't believe, but um, for the sadness and anxiety, um, this is a great piece. I love this piece so much. Um, and for as art as a container for sadness and, and, and anxiety, um, in a way we can, with those states, we can really keep emotions moving through ourselves. Um, when we're expressing ourselves in, in, a, in a form that is not meet, met by resistance, you know, or judgment from others and ourselves. Um, so this, an example of that would be good or ill intentions of wanting to fix um, or reframe our sadness and anxiety. Um, and um, when, when sadness and, and sorrow kind of interacts, um, intersects also with anger a lot too, because you can see this is the name of this is crazy mind mouth shut, which is sort of that feeling of silence, being silent. So, so there is some anger there. Um, these feelings sort of take on a more ephemeral, temporary passing um, uh, uh, element where, where it, it, a space opens um, for it to be valid and reasonable and real. Um, which is just the beauty of art, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and I think a lot of us can, can identify with feeling the feeling of being silenced. Um, but in a way, just by this peace existing, that silence is broken. And that anger is, that anger and sadness and anxiety um, could be in part, um, maybe not resolved, but, you know, given voice. Um, and um, another um, thing, and this will get us a bit into the pandemic um, more, um, is trauma, collective and individual. Um, so um, we can see in this piece um, that um, we, uh, Jennifer C Siciliano, um, did this wonderful, wonderful piece um, about the pandemic. And I'm literally just going to read part of her statement, her about this work section. Um, but before I do, I wanted to uh, go back to um, one of the other artists quote, which I love, and just say um, two things before we read her statement. Um, Lydia Eccles, um says, uh, I tend to unconsciously turn a life problem into an art project, inverting value like alchemy. What distressed me under, under observation becomes fa fascinating, or once it, it is art, it is no longer a problem, or 
an art problem is exciting. So while I read um, Jennifer's statement, um, I want you to um, really think about um, how this shows this, the perspective of transforming personal and collective trauma. Um, and, you know, how, um, you know, think about what we've said about art as container as something that can be held and honored, communicated and transformed, you know, as uh, these deep and painful feelings. And, and also think about the artist here. Think about her sitting with what was happening to her and, and her bravery, you know, in putting this all on the page and the process of that. And I'll just read it. As Governor Cuomo recited the words, New Rochelle, over and over during his press conference early in the pandemic, explaining where the New York hot zone was located. I needed to emotionally deal with the fact that he was speaking of my hometown where my family and many of my friends still live. New Rochelle is just north of New York City and became the center of where the virus broke out in not only New York State, but the nation. The city weakened, weakened and nearly devastated by the deadly whirlwind of COVID-19. Never had I ever witnessed such a sight in my old backyard. Whole neighborhoods were marked off with yellow police tape bordering the quarantined areas. I, I was most struck by the severity of this virus when I arrived at one of the first COVID drive-through testing centers at New Rochelle's Glen Island off the Long Island Sound early in mid-March. Managed by the National Guard, the site was populated with medical professionals swabbing us in hazmat suits, and I realized this emerging pandemic was quite serious. I was so humbled by the courage, love, and kindness they were exhibiting on the front line each and every day as the true warriors of this battle, as people were dying in droves. Although they were covered up in masks, I saw their tribal headdresses with feathers in their caps for exhi exhibiting such bravery proving to everyone why they got into the medical field to begin with, to help others. And I was so touched by their selfless giving, all while people in lockdown were concerned with getting haircuts. My painting, The Front Line, is a tribute to these warriors, and I thank them still to each day for helping my birth city get back on its feet. So I always, you know, I feel that deserves a moment um, uh, just of appreciation for, you know, what artists are capable of expressing um, even when it's such a deep trauma. Um, so um, I'd love to even just give this more time, but, I, I'm, I'm going to move on to mindfulness. Um, I think this piece speaks for itself. Um, and let's see. So Benjamin Tran, um, I love this piece. When I saw it, I was just so, um, so enamored with it. Um, you can see here, and I'll zoom in real big on this. Um, so I, I, art making in some ways can feel like a trance. Um, especially when you're kind of embracing sort of play and improvisation and non-judgment um, around um, the work um, and you, you're creating a mental environment with, with free of obstructions um, and you uh, are allowing for the natural occurrence of mistakes and that can be seen as part of the rightness of a piece or the rightness of a project or a process. Um, you know, it's not always about the product. Um, so I always hope to um, pass on a message about art is that uh, the way we engage with it, we can bring that into our lives as well and, and improve our own and others' lives. Um, and especially when it's pertained to a kind of mindfulness practice. So, so Benjamin Tran has lived with um, lived experience of anxiety and depression especially during the physical isolation from friends and family brought on by the pandemic. Um, he says, all I can do is accept my experience as it is, resist less, 
adapt and move with the world. Art is my primary mindfulness practice. It is the one thing that has helped me to, to keep me grounded and close to self. When I am making art, I am anchored in the present moment. I ask the art where it wants to go and it becomes alive because I allow for it to be expressed without resistance. My creative space involves curiosity and discovery, not ex expectations or regret. It is full of risk-taking and experimentation. It is full, fully process-oriented. I care less about the final piece I end up with. I care much more about what I learn along the process of creation, which I learn about myself and nature. Art is simply a medium for me to interact with the present moment. It is a back and forth or a dance with the present moment. The present moment is my teacher. I make art to learn and to listen, not for the final product. So um, I think he says that very eloquently um, about um, sort of a mindful practice in art. Um, and one thing I wanted to talk about today too is of course creating access um, to art for survivals and uh, survivors and particularly um, people in withdrawal um, from psychi psychiatric drugs. Um, as I'm currently um, in this process as well, um, ha have had a, a rough physical time <laughs> for the last month and a half. So I've been thinking about this. Um, and one thing I think about a lot is um, sort of how um, art allows us um, to adapt to our own limitations, um, to changing circumstances um, by seeing art as, like I said in that quote um, by another artist was, um, you know, seeing uh, life as an art problem. <laughs> so getting, getting creative um, with your own limitations. And one thing that I saw too is um, one of the artists, um, Adrian Stacy. Uh, was uh, during the time she submitted to the Creativity in COVID um, exhibition was um, she said in her statement, um, she was currently institutionalized and, and she said, I'm almost a survivor, but still contending for the truth. And I thought that was a strong um, statement there. And um, I remember this from my hospitalizations is, is being able to, um, uh, I wasn't allowed scissors, but you know, being able to tear out um, pieces of magazines and make um, collages, which is probably one of the more common art practices in mental institutions right now, um, which actually is is quite um, profound and 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 um, can be um, a wonderful practice um, anywhere. Um, so um, she calls this the involuntary journals because um, she was involuntarily um, uh, committed. A semi on the inside. She says, how does a semi intuition keep herself sane on the inside? Stringing beads for eight weeks just wouldn't appeal to me. As I was a teacher for those challenging kids at both ends of the spectrum, employing all my creativity to keep difficult students engaged. College, you may call it, which I contend would use a lot more random symbols and without a true thread of meaning or sequence, this current work while here now on the inside is my way of exploring those angry to recover spaces that I know I really need as my own mental health toolkit as there are no programs on wellness recovery here, so sad this is. So I make my own fun and show a select few to a psychiatrist. That's nothing about mindfulness I hear from the other side of the fence. But doctor, consider the five hours of reading and cutting just the right craziness to recover beautiful works of other artists as I do my own mashup work, a musical term. Semiotics, what's that, you may ask. It's the study of every possible way a human can use to communicate something. It looks at any form or symbol, written or spoken words, dance, theater, music, architecture, facial nuance, etc. I study semiotics in the purest sense in my university work, looking deeply at the magnificent art and children's picture books and how artists employ colors and shapes, movement, action, and characterize as the story moves along. No, Adrian, you have a disease for which I politely disagree with smiles, calmly contending we should really chat about the trauma of drugs-only psychiatry. So 
I wanted to bring this to the table as as an example of um, art that is adapting in art making that's adapting to a limitation and probably one of the uh, most powerful limitations that we run into when we are um, experiencing mental distress, which um, is uh, is being institutionalized. Um, so another way of, uh, of uh, talking about adapting to limitations um, is, uh, is a little bit more pandemic fo focused again, which is um, another piece that I really enjoyed um, was this um, Zoom gallery. Um, so Lydia Cleese, um, you know, she, she says in her biography that she's had mental distress throughout her life, um, several hospitalizations, um, seven years ordeal getting totally off poly, Pharmacistic, yes, polypharmacy. We know that what that means. Um, so she says, when not actively involved in an art project, I lose all sense of meaning, self, and isolate. Art orders and structures me. And she says of this project, which she just started doodling people's faces that she would be encountering and interacting with on Zoom. What a relief to use my hands, do something tangible. Um, they're, um, they're a huge close-up for me to examine as I could never do in person, liberate for a time from mousing and typing. My drawings seem to have more sense of humanity than the digital photo representation I'm looking at. Me, a real person, looked at transmitted pixel patterns of a distant analog person. I transform flickering pixels into a durable real thing, redigitizing, retransmitting. You see it now and again, pixelated a great distance. So um, this is an example of someone taking a, a limiting um, situation um, and making an art problem of it. Um, you know, we were all sort of uh, stuck at home, you know, reaching out to people we love on Zoom. And this is how Lydia um, chose to, to manage that. Um, which I thought was very profound and beautiful. So just my last thing before we go into just a discussion, um, I think I'm in doing good time here. <laughs> um, so in withdrawal, um, I found, you know, the, the heightened uh, state of the nervous system uh, when, you, you, when you take some of these uh, medications away, even if you do it as slowly as possible, um, there's, there's sort of a, a, an interruption of, of not an interruption, but a, a change, a transformation of how you're engaging with um, reality, which is a limitation. Um, things become overwhelming quickly. Um, you know, anger and fear become a, a lot more present. Um, and, and I think that um, for me, first of all, um, removing kind of uh, the fear, and I'll come back, let me come back from the images, that's the last of the artwork that I'm going to show you. Um, so removing like fear around um, disturbing experiences and images. Now we talk about images, my experiences with withdrawal at nighttime, I started getting um, more disturbing visuals, um, which I've read actually um, from a few, few studies and stories um, might actually be some manifestation of akathisia. Um, so what I have tried to do is, as an artist, um, remove the fear of a disturbing image, um, place some distance between me and it um, that art can do when you're, like we said in the beginning, creating a, a, a observation makes it a, f a fascinating thing rather than terrifying. Um, and, and being able to kind of internalize, inter internalizing, as I did with those images, um, the art making mindset that I'm talking about here, non judgment, um, uh, understanding the process of things, which we can, in withdrawal, we can understand the process of healing, the nervous system kind of healing um, from this removal of, of a certain chemical. Um, and rediscovering the, the, a, a person rediscovering themselves with play, um, removing fear, um, and Improvisation and non-judgment. So we talked about that too. Um, never enforcing a sense of what we think is real on someone. Never enforcing that. Um, because 
also we can't ever enforce the judgment of what is good and bad expressions in, in an art making context in, in the way I see it, um, because art is healing and we cannot dictate what healing is to someone. So um, I'll stop there and we'll just, I just wanna open the floor to see what people think about um, what I've said here today. And then also kind of in the context of how can art help us create social change? Um, how we engage with it individually and socially and how can we use that to come out of this pandemic a better people as a globe. Um, so, you know, you can engage in any way you want. Um, if you have any comments, let me know. I'd love to hear what you think. This is my favorite part is hearing what everybody has to think. So, cause that's how, that's how, uh, you know, collaboration is the best. Uh, for me, art is my happy place, mm -hmm. is that um, I, I am sometimes troubled by the English language and that it's a way for me to express um, feelings and ideas and a state of mind and also my politics mm -hmm. okay? sometimes as well. Like, so, uh, you know, my, my thing is photography and also you know, like video. Mm -hmm. So it for me it captures, and and it's funny is that I forgot, uh, you know when I became very disabled and got into the psych, you know, like the intense psychiatric pharma, pharmacological nightmare, um, is that I started doing my photography again, and mm -hmm. I defined myself as being disabled. Mm -hmm. um, but what I did is that other people started to say, oh, you know what, your photography is cool. And I started to get involved with disabled artists mm -hmm. and being, and I think that's when actually you and I might've have, might have come across yeah. when, I was, when I was in shows. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember it was a fundraiser at the, yeah, at the hospital. Mm -hmm. Right, but it was, it was a way of me making community and expressing myself. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it was, you know, and it was oftentimes it was considered healing art. Mm -hmm. And you know, and a lot of my work ended up in places which was considered healing art. You know, so I can completely relate to you know, some of the things you're saying mm -hmm. you know, about, about, you know, the advantages of art. You know, and it was, it was similar for COVID. You know, it was yeah. just, it was just. You know, it was you know, uh, it was my sanity. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people said that definitely that it was their sanity. Stephen, uh, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I was also diagnosed with bipolar when I was 21 years old. Oh wow, yeah. I was in the hospital four times within five or six years, and one yeah. thing that I did while I was in the hospital, kind of locked up and leave, was write music. And I'm a drummer, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not really like I can't read music, but I can read rhythms. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've played a lot of musicals when it comes to drums, but I never really wrote songs before. But when I was in the hospital, I wrote all these like five or six different songs. And I like, it kind of like inspired me to like create music while I was mm -hmm. like in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and then while the pandemic, you know, the pandemic was so long, like I, I started journaling. Mm -hmm. So I journal almost 45 minutes to an hour every single day uh, mm -hmm. for the past year and a half or so. And it's like, it's really helping me with my anxiety and, yeah. and all that stuff. And I, I just think, you know, artwork, I'm not, I'm not a painter or draw or anything like that, but mm -hmm. music to me is an expression and, 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 and just writing, you know, being a writer. I think that's something that I'm not, you know, I'm not nothing's going to get published, but I do mm -hmm. love to write. And I think that's helped me through this pandemic. That's amazing. Yeah, that's great. And, and I hear that so much, you know, and it's so, so heartening to hear. It's, it's great that you're journaling. That's amazing. And and I do love musicians. I wish I I wish I could write music. I'm I'm horrible at it. Um, yeah, but the, um, there's something that resonates, you know, with with each of us. Um, and and uh, music is surely one of the most one of the most beautiful human expressions that I I've come in contact with. I, I music makes life meaningful in so many ways. Um, Cynthia, you had your hands up, and we have some things in the chat. Um. Oh, well, hello. Uh, 
Um, it. Oh, excuse me. No, no worries. Putting my art away. <laughs> ah, you're putting your um, art away. <laughs> I, I, I've been drawing while we. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I I don't know how to um put this into words exactly, but I am deeply honored. Uh, to uh, meet you and to hear this uh, presentation and to meet everyone here um, who has come um, to your workshop. Um, I, I literally just kind of hung on every word that you, you, you shared and, and, and as you explored um, the different avenues of, of art as healing, um, I really resonated with your questions that you left us with of how can art um, be a voice for social change and, and and just any and all of that. I, I guess I'm feeling like I'd really like to continue to know you and others who are, um, I don't know, doing, doing, looking at these questions and mm -hmm. I'm not sure where it's all going to go, but um, <laughs> I, I'm really glad to be here and I, I feel like there's some open doors in the future. Um, sure, please do. Please do contact me um, after this uh, meeting. Um, you know, I'd love to continue the conversation in any way. Um, it has to be. I I um I will share. Um, I I um started. Uh, it was one of my darker times in in life. You know, there was like five major traumatic things. I think most people would have, as you know, agree would be pretty traumatic to be experiencing and. Um, and, and, and I found myself, you know, along my, in my, my, the first time I was in my apartment and I literally just started to paint everything, like mm. everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, every yeah. table, bookshelf, wall, window yeah. frame, door, yeah, and, right. um, over years, the, um, it, it's a unique place. <laughs> yeah. you um, know, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no. I, I was going to mention that um, Madden America uh, uh, does a, a weekly um, arting co-arting space that I run um, on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. It's open to anybody. Um, all we do is we just kind of for an hour, we um, we create. Sometimes we have a little music in the background. Sometimes we chat. Sometimes we don't chat at all. We just all just focus and do our work. So that is one way that we can continue the conversation. Um, and Felisa, um, you know, I'd love to hear what your question is. I was thinking that, um, you know, I, I've been doing art um, for a while, for about 10 years after, after a traumatic event. And what started out as being, as being a coping skill mm -hmm. now has changed to being both a mindfulness practice and expression. Um, because for me, it's interesting because art is where I learn to love myself. Mm -hmm. I don't judge what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I, don't attach, I don't attach to the outcome because that's not where the magic happens anyway. Right, 100%, yep. You know, and, and, and whatever you hold in your own hand can only tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And and so it's really become more powerful than it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, because I never took I didn't have any formal art training. Mm -hmm. I didn't take it when I was in high school. So so it's like I started with a completely blank slate. Mm -hmm. And and I thought, well, you know, if you're gonna start with a blank slate, then every single piece you start with beginner's mind. Yes, yeah. Because if you don't know, you, you, there's a lot of freedom in not knowing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you don't have to conform so much to uh, what art critics would love to to pick at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you I, know? Um, I love the idea, like, I, and, and I, I subscribe to it, uh, this self-love in the art making process of learning to love yourself. Um, it is it is probably second to being um, able to be alone with oneself um, in just life as, as being able to be with your art making practice in a loving non judgmental way. I think I think that for me has been such a powerful um, path um, to um, uh, caring for and loving myself. 
um, as who I am and what I am, you know. So I just wanted to note that um, it's it's 1245 and I know that we were going to go for 40 minutes. So, you know, I'm open to staying a little longer to discuss, but, um, you know, um, if anybody needs to leave, go ahead. I, I'm I'm open to, to staying a little bit longer, maybe another 15 minutes till, till one o'clock. Um, so if it, oh, it looks like An Angela Franklin, you have some, something yeah. to say? Yeah. Yes, um, this is this has definitely been very powerful. And okay. um, I thank you for sharing. Um, I am, art has saved me. It's something that I've always uh, done to uh, bounce back from uh, years of depression and, and PTSD and all that stuff. Um, and now I'm at a different place in trying to figure out who I am as an artist. Um, I do a whole variety of stuff. I'm more of a, I guess, more of a crafter, mm -hmm. but I like to share uh, and teach others how to use art um, uh, to help themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of the role that I'm, I'm walk, walking in right now. Um, so I have art supplies everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> Yeah. all over the place and so mm -hmm. um you know I work with young people uh uh the elderly mm -hmm. um and I presently work in a hospital so um I'm doing you know safe art mm -hmm. for those that are uh in, uh, in the hospital so mm -hmm. uh just as a means of uh more of an encourager you know so I use my art to encourage yeah. I guess I could say that so yeah. I'm not really, I'm not really, I can't really say that I'm really good at anything. Mm. I just kind of have my hands in a little bit of everything, you mm -hmm. know, just, if I could learn it, then I can teach it. Yeah, so. no, I love that. Also the idea of um, the encouragement we can give people. Um, yeah. And I, I try as well to be, you know, as, as encouraging um, to everyone. And I'm talking about everyone really um you know uh, to 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 engage with it in whatever way um yeah. they, they're able they're able yeah and um i love that i'm so excited for you that that you're on this journey to to discover your yeah. yourself and your art making and and how how that works for you it's, right. it's so it's such a beautiful journey i love it thank you so much for yeah. just sharing your your art and uh your love for it and yeah it's yeah it's really inspiring so thank you Thank you for being here and sharing. Yeah. I always think that the, if we took kind of the idea of art making um, and this kind of non-judgmental um, loving stance towards, towards creating, like um, if we took it into the world um, individually, um, we could make some real change. You know, we really could. And in, 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 uh, people, people close to us in our lives, and, and in a broader sense, you know? Uh, so I really do believe art making and, and creativity is, is a social force as powerful as technology, as powerful as science, um, as powerful as all of these things, um, maybe more. <laughs> people, people argue with me every time I say that, but I really do believe that, that creativity and art making is a social force, an extremely powerful one. So, um, yeah, does anybody else have anything they want to say? I just love the, the group, this group, this, the energy in this group is just so amazing. It's, it's so great. I have one other question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I missed the very beginning, so I don't know. Did, uh, are you um, like an art? therapist or <laughs> not trained no I've never <laughs> been trained no I'm just an artist um but uh you know I grew up in uh, I, uh my grandmother and my mother was an artist and um uh and I uh have been an artist my whole life so um yeah not trained yeah <laughs> but I, I do I, I, <laughs> yeah that's kind of where um I wanted to go back to school now and become an art therapist type thing. oh great yeah but in order to do that 
I would have to get my degree first, yeah. uh, a master's in psychology or, or counseling, and then, then do the art therapy. Thing. Or you can just be covert, like be a okay. ninja, be like a ninja art therapist, like do it okay. wherever, wherever you can, you know? Yeah. Well, that's what, that's kind of what I do now, you know, yeah. I'm not, I don't have the title behind my name, but yeah, art is definitely therapeutic and I try to I uh, use it wherever I am and with yeah. whoever I can. So it's a way of life. It's a way of being. Yeah. You don't need a degree to thank to, you to for live that that way. Way. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, you you had your hand raised. Yeah, I wanted to echo thanks, Karen, for this just amazing I think um, presentation, information, and like I have so many you know things I want to come back to. So I'll come to the record uh, recording and. I didn't want to take notes because I just want to be immersed in this. So um, my brain's kind of like, wow, like so much to think about. Um, I love the perspectives and I love the idea of artist container. Mm -hmm. um, just so much of what you shared and the artwork, just incredible. And I love the idea of it holding um, kind of extreme states, altered states, any of what people um, experience during psychiatric drug withdrawal, which can be very long lasting profoundly debilitating um and ultimately you know we free ourselves so this is just such an important I don't want to say tool but like such an important aspect of that experience and thank you so much yeah thank you Sarah so much and and I will mention that Sarah is the one who brought up the container theory to me <laughs> she is the friend who brought it up um oh Cynthia sorry yes oh no Oh, you were going like this. I, I thought you were saying- <laughs> I was just going- <laughs> Oh, you were giving a thumbs up. Awesome. Um, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll close it out um, just uh, by saying, um, let's keep in touch. I have everyone's email, um, you know, and I'll, uh, I can put mine um, in the chat, um, my Man in America email. And- you know, let's keep the conversation. Oops, nope, that's Tashira. I did that wrong. Um, everyone, let me try that one more time. Uh, Madinamerica.com. And uh, yeah, please do reach out to me. I'm serious. I'm not joking about that. Um, and love to you all. And uh, keep creating and be good and kind to yourself. Um, and uh, thank you so much for coming.